Whether it's bouncing around Hyrule Field and Ocarina of Time in an attempt to forge the big Goron sword, or assisting Mallow in setting up shop in Twilight Princess's Hyrule Castle Town, side quests have always played a big role throughout the Legend of Zelda franchise. When done correctly, they stand out just as strongly as the exploits you have on your main adventure, and for The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, they are what truly define the entire experience. There are many memorable stories from helping Romani fend off aliens to assisting Kremia in her milk delivery, but if you've played Majora's Mask, you know there is one quest that stands above all the rest. With multiple significant rewards, several emotionally powerful moments, a cast of endearing characters, and a multitude of different outcomes, it is the most complex and multi-layered quest in Zelda history. Of course, we are talking about the story involving the lovers Anju and Cafe, which deserves a deep dive so we can really appreciate what makes this wonderful quest so unforgettable. But before we begin, remember to like the video and subscribe if you enjoy this type of content. It's free, lets me get videos to you faster, and helps the channel more than you know. Thanks, now on to the best side quest in Zelda history. For those not in the loop or for those who need a refresher, Anju and Cafe are two lovers that are set to wed during the Carnival of Time that will take place at the end of Majora's Mask 3 days. Unfortunately, before the wedding can take place, Cafe is transformed into a childlike version of himself by the mischievous Skull Kid, and as a result his ceremonial sun mask is targeted and stolen by a thief named Sakon. As he promised to exchange that mask with Anju to make their engagement official, Cafe retreats into hiding hoping to recover his mask so he can fulfill his commitment to her. However, because he does not tell anyone outside of a close family friend his whereabouts, it is up to Link to find Cafe in order to quell the panic that his disappearance has caused within Clocktown. After speaking with Cafe's mother, Madame Aroma, in the mayor's office, Link can receive the Cafe mask and begin his investigation. By talking to the various citizens of Clocktown while wearing the mask, he can pick up bits of information on the missing groom before eventually encountering Anju in the Stockpot Inn. From that point forward, Link becomes the liaison for the separated couple, relaying their touching messages back and forth as he tries his best to help connect them. Eventually, Cafe is able to locate the thief who stole his prized possession before the events of the game and follow him back to his hideout. Then, through a series of events that see Link and Cafe team up, the duo are able to retrieve the missing sun mask from Sakon's lair with little time to spare. Finally, after hastily returning to Clocktown, Link can make it back to Anju to witness the couple reuniting during the final hours in one of the most wholesome and heartwarming cutscenes in Zelda history. One of the main reasons that the Anju and Cafe plotline is one of the most engaging and rewarding quests in any video game is its ability to make the player feel the emotions of the characters involved through scenes like this. Truthfully, it is a strength of Majora's Mask in general, but it's felt most potently here as Anju and Cafe embrace. No further context is truly needed in this moment to feel the love that these two have for one another because it's easy to understand. There are so many little details, like how Anju drops the cafe's level without a word needing to be said, or the power and intensity of cafe's hug that makes this scene feel so real and impactful. Oftentimes, when you are playing a Legend of Zelda game, it can be hard to relate to the characters because no one in real life is bound to the divine destiny of a hero, but the cast in the Anju and Cafe quest buck that trend by being grounded in reality. Their stories are simple and relatable, and allow you to understand who these people are and what their motivations are as well. Seeing the way they react to their personal issues, as well as the looming threat of a falling moon, makes it easy to connect emotionally to them because they feel human. For instance, watching Anju cry on a bench in the rain and blame herself for her missing fiancé hurts because you feel so bad for her and can feel her pain. Her shaking and sobbing is portrayed in a realistic way that makes her instantly relatable to anyone who has blamed themselves for a bad situation or a failing relationship. You can't help but want to assist in reuniting her with her significant other because of the way your sympathy for Andrew builds through cutscenes like these. And what's remarkable about this quest is that every individual in it, big or small, has moments like these that endear you to them. The attention to detail that was put into this story is something I strongly admire, and a large part of why I consider it to be the best Zelda side quest. I'm sure there are more than a few of you watching who have played Majora's Mask and didn't even know this scene existed, and that's one aspect I love about this quest. The developers did a great job of accounting for most scenarios, and they really reward you for investing yourself fully in its events, as the more you explore into it, the more you'll find. There are so many hidden scenes and nuggets of information that you can pick up, just like this section with Anju on the bench, that add depth to the overall plot. For example, how many of you are aware that there is an entire subplot of infidelity that explores the possibility of Cafe running off to Romani Ranch to be with Anju's friend Kremia? 
We'll explore that more in just a little bit, but I'd imagine that less than half of the people who've played this quest even know how detailed that story is. With that in mind, of all the ways that the Anju and Cafe side quest sets itself apart from others in the Zelda franchise, its ability to contain many subplots that add to the drama and excitement of the main story being told is what impresses me the most. By involving other citizens such as Madame Aroma or the Postman, we are able to feel the weight and significance of the events of this quest on a deeper level because we can see how everything in Clocktown is interconnected. At the same time, our relationships with these characters strengthen because we learn more about their lives and values, which gives us even more of an incentive to try and resolve their issues. Reuniting Cafe and Anju becomes more important as it is the culmination of so many smaller stories, and for as satisfying as it is to see this pair become a couple in front of you, it is equally as satisfying to put at ease the tensions of the supporting cast involved. To really understand what I'm talking about, we have to take a look at a few of these moments in detail to see not only what makes them special, but how they enhance this quest's main story. However, before we do, it is worth mentioning that even if you don't discover any of its extra layers, you will still be treated to an incredibly satisfying and complete narrative. To me, this above all else is what makes this a brilliant side quest, because you feel rewarded for finding these intimate moments instead of feeling punished for not discovering them. And this is important because truthfully, the level of optional content you can find in this quest is astounding, especially when considering how fleshed out the main plot already is. That said, I think the best way to start illustrating what makes this quest so special, beyond its main story, is by taking a look at the Postman. You see him bustling around Clocktown as you progress through Majora's Mask, but a majority of the time when you try to speak to him, he will scold you for interrupting his mail delivery schedule. Because of this, it wouldn't surprise me if many players just disregarded him altogether, as aside from a minigame you can play with him to earn a piece of heart, it doesn't seem like there is a whole lot going on with this dedicated employee. However, by following him around on his daily routine, we are able to witness scenes that add context to the Anju and Cafe narrative that would otherwise be missing. The first is in the Stockpot Inn, where you can witness Anju's shocked reaction upon receiving Cafe's letter. After the postman delivers it to her, she asks which postbox he collected the letter from, but he won't tell her claiming that it's a secret. Similarly, if we talk to the postman along his route while wearing the cafe mask, he will tell Link nearly the same thing, showing he's not planning on divulging the missing groom's location to anyone. While that may not seem like a big deal at first, to me it is very revealing of the postman's integrity, as later we can be present for the delivery of Anju's letter to cafe. This tells me that despite knowing Cafe's whereabouts, he is closely guarding that information either out of respect for Cafe's desire to stay hidden, or to simply uphold his duty as a mail carrier. Either scenario makes this seemingly unimportant character far more endearing, and shows the role the postman subtly plays in bringing Anju and Cafe back together. More importantly, it allows us to feel a deeper connection to the postman when it comes time to assist him with his own issues. Knowing how he has helped this unfortunate couple in his own way makes us want to see his own dilemma get resolved because he deserves it. You don't want to watch him lay on his bed during the afternoon of the final day in existential dread because no letters have been mailed due to everyone fleeing. You don't want to see him race past mailboxes as he goes out for a pointless delivery. And you don't want to observe him fearfully panic as he struggles to deal with the reality of the moon crashing down. Genuinely, it is heart-wrenching, and I'm not sure if there is something as sad in Majora's Mask as following the postman as he sends himself a letter begging and pleading to flee, despite it not being written into the schedule. This is why it feels so good to give him the priority mail we received earlier in the quest rather than delivering it to Madame Aroma ourselves. Bearing witness to his newfound resolve upon having clear direction once again is cathartic, and a feeling that only gets more intense when we follow the postman to the milk bar to watch as Madame Aroma gives him the official dismissal he's been looking for. His exuberant and gleeful reaction to being set free is a reward far beyond the piece of heart we earned for receiving the postman's hat, and it wouldn't be possible to view without first helping Cafe locate Sakon in the main story. Similarly, Cafe and Anju could not have their moment together without the Postman's diligence, which is why their reconnection is all the more fulfilling when we know that the honest, innocent, and hardworking man who helped this union happen has finally earned the freedom he desperately desired. This side story is one of my favorites in Zelda because it does a terrific job of elevating the stakes of the Anju and Cafe quest. You now understand that bringing these two together has far-reaching consequences outside its own result, and it transforms a character that probably should have been forgotten into one of the most memorable in Majora's Mask. I'm also fond of how it complements the game's core mechanic of time travel, as the chances are slim that you'll be able to pick all this information up in one go. 
You will likely discover many of the segments I mentioned after you already know what happens if you aren't able to help the postman, which makes the eventual resolution even more gratifying than it would have been if you could just help him right away. Now this may be a point of contention, but the fact that multiple cycles have to be played to reveal the full narrative of the Anju and Cafe story is something I see as a positive. As I said earlier, I really enjoy how it makes use of Majora's Mask's time travel feature by rewarding you for your knowledge of what is going to happen in the future. It rewards you for making logical connections, and allows a simple story to become more complex as you peel back its layers slowly over time. I understand for some it's frustrating to miss out on content because you couldn't figure out how to trigger it, or simply couldn't trigger it based on actions you had previously taken in the cycle, but I've always seen that as one of the most pleasing aspects of replaying this quest over the years. I've known the actions I need to take in the main plot since my first playthrough, but it feels like each time I play this quest again I discover something new that makes me appreciate it even more. That's no more true than in the subplot I mentioned earlier surrounding the idea that Cafe isn't in hiding, but rather at Romani Ranch to be with Kremia, and I think it's time to explore that story in a little more detail. The first whiff of this notion can be discovered directly after gaining the Cafe mask by talking to the receptionist in the mayor's office. She'll allude to Cafe wanting to break off his engagement to Anju, and give the impression that if that's what he wants, then his mother should stop trying to track him down and just let it happen. However, this feels odd, as we can find and read Cafe's diary in the back room of Madame Aroma's office, whose wholesome words indicate he has no intentions of disappearing. This is backed up by Mr. Barton in the milk bar, as he will vouch for Cafe's character by stating he must have a good reason to hide, and that he'd come back when the time is right. Of course, we know this to be true, as Cafe tells us as such when we meet him for the first time in the laundry pool, yet other characters don't seem as convinced. Among those is Anju's mother, who believes that Cafe is unfaithful and has run off to Romani Ranch to be with its owner Kremia. In a secret cutscene that can only be accessed by acquiring the key to the knife chamber and the stockpot in, Lincoln eavesdrop on Anju and her mother's conversation to hear that she believes this to be the case because it makes logical sense for the two to be together. This is enforced whenever you speak to Anju's mom while wearing the Cafe mask, as she aggressively and negatively reacts under the assumption that Cafe is an adulterer. This by itself adds an interesting layer to the couple's plight, but when we investigate why she feels this way a little further, it gets significantly more compelling. By taking a trip to Romani Ranch on the night of the third day, we can find Anju's family has indeed taken refuge at Kremia's house, with Anju's presence hinging on whether or not we delivered the pendant of memories to her. If we choose not to give her the necklace, we will find her distraught and lamenting her decision to leave instead of waiting for Cafe, while if we do deliver it, she will hold on to hope and stay in Clocktown. If this happens, speaking to Andrew's mother will unveil some information about her past that gives a massive amount of context to her daughter's current situation. She tells us that she feels responsible for Andrew's naivety because she herself made the mistake of hoping that Andrew's dad would return after deserting her when he never did. This is backed up by her comments in the knife chamber scene where she mentions Anju ending up unhappy just like her, and further enforced by admitting that she may have been too harsh on Anju when she flees with them. But why would Anju's mom feel she was too harsh on her if she really was just protecting Anju from a similar fate to her own? Well, it's because Anju's mom lied about her husband to try and shield Anju from the unpleasant truths of life. Rather than admitting to Anju that her father abandoned them, we can discover that Anju believes that her father died. By speaking to her in the kitchen area of the Stockpot Inn at around 11am on either of the first two days, Angel will comment on how the inn used to be a cafeteria, but they switched their focus to room rentals not because her father disappeared, but because he passed away. This is quite the revelation because it explains why Anju is so confident that Cafe will keep his word. Perhaps had her mother been more honest with her, Anju's reaction to this whole ordeal might have been a little bit more guarded. She may have been more suspicious, and even picked up on the fact that Kremia has a crush on Cafe, like we can by talking to her little sister Romani at the ranch, and decided to not trust him and flee. But we'll never know because Andrew's mom withheld that truth from her, which shows how this seemingly irrelevant character actually influences the events of this quest in a major way. Not only that, but we get yet another powerful insight into Andrew's personal life that allows us to empathize with her on a deeper level. It makes it easier to root for Anju when we now know how pure and innocent she truly is, and the desire to preserve that for her gives us even more motivation to bring this couple together in the end. Truthfully, so many of these extra details can be missed if you don't take it upon yourself to explore and connect the dots. I'm extremely confident that for a large portion of Zelda fans, Anju's mom has always seemed like a pointless NPC in the same vein as the part-time shop employee in West Clocktown because of the effort it takes to gather all this information. 
At the same time, requiring that effort is why the Anju and Cafe Quest excels, because it provides engaging content for new and old players alike. You don't have to interact with Anju's mom at all to enjoy this narrative for what it is, but the fact that you can discover that she is vastly more important to the story than it seemed at first glance only serves to make the main plot more interesting. It's a testament to how well-crafted this side quest is, and how the developers accounted for so many different scenarios that the player could find themselves in when they really didn't need to. This can be seen clearest in one of the most hidden segments in the game, where you speak to Mayor Dortor while wearing the cafe mask. Doing so will trigger him to tell you to investigate the curiosity shop, mentioning that its owner is a bad influence on him. This shows that Mayor Dator might actually know his son's whereabouts, as he is likely aware the curiosity shop man is harboring Cafe, but must lie to his wife to keep it a secret. While this dialogue can seem pointless, as you can only access this scene by resolving the carpenter and town guard's conflict with the reward for completing the Anju and Cafe quest, I've always appreciated the commitment to world building found here. It shows why Cafe would trust the Curiosity Shop man, as in addition to the bond they share over the Keaton mask, he clearly has a connection to Cafe's family. This level of detail is what truly elevates this quest to its legendary status. Nothing feels better than discovering new information in a game you've played countless times, and this quest has so many opportunities for that to happen. Unless you are extremely thorough, it is easy to miss interactions like Sakon getting bent over a barrel by the Curiosity Shop Man, or Kremia's short defensive response to the Cafe Mask, which gives this quest a ton of replayability. It also adds a layer of realism to these characters that help them stand out, as it's easy to relate with someone like Kremia who is understandably frustrated if she's assumed to be a homewrecker, or the Curiosity Shop Man who is justifiably unfair to Sakon because he knows he stole from his friend. What this ultimately creates is a compelling cast of characters that are all interesting and contribute to the Anju and Cafe quest in unique ways. The Postman, Anju's mom, Kremia, and the Curiosity Shop owner all enhance this quest by having backstories that make you invest in them and their role in the plot. Even the tertiary characters add to the narrative in a meaningful way because we are forced to make tough decisions around them in order to progress the story. We have to knowingly allow Sakon to rob the old lady so Cafe can find him when he tries to sell bomb bags at the curiosity shop. And we have to deceive Anju and steal the traveling Goron's reservation to gain more context for the story, leaving the poor man to sleep outside in the cold. These characters' roles may be insignificant, but the actions we have to take surrounding them definitely add significance because we know what sacrifices were made to ensure this couple is reunited. In the end, these characters wind up connected to one another in an organic way that help Clocktown feel alive. It's honestly amazing how so many independent stories are utilized to create something more meaningful in the end, and it gives Majora's Mask hub area a distinct personality that no other Zelda town can compare to. Each time we begin a new cycle and see Cafe emerge from the laundry pool, we are given a reminder of the stories that can be uncovered here, and how just like the other areas of Termina, Clocktown itself is in need of healing. This perfectly reinforces Majora's Mask's central themes, and perhaps more so than any other area, gives us the motivation we need to stop the Skull Kid. Now, for most of the video I've talked about the side stories and additional layers that can be found to enhance the Anju and Cafe quest, but I just want to reiterate that even without all of this amazing extra content, there are still plenty of incredible moments throughout the main quest. It's heartwarming to meet with Anju at night to learn that she's too scared to meet with her fiancé, it's empowering to be entrusted with the delivery of Cafe's pendant of memories, and it's thrilling to infiltrate Sakon's hideout to steal back the Sun Mask. These are the core scenes around which the narrative is structured for good reason, and without them the story would not be the same. It's important to remember that even though there are far more optional scenes than required ones, they are all in service to making what is mandatory as impactful as it can be. An area I just mentioned like Sakon's hideout, for example, is memorable on its own for several reasons like briefly playing as Cafe, but it's so much more memorable when we know how many outcomes hinge on recovering the Sun Mask. It's not just Cafe's pride or Anju's innocence on the line, it's justice for the old bomb bag lady and the traveling Goron who got caught in the crossfire of this quest. It's hope for Madame Aroma, resolution for the postman, and peace for Mayor Detour. Yes, on its own, just clearing this short yet intense set of puzzles is relieving, but the relief that comes with success is ten times greater when we are aware of all the factors that led to this moment of triumph. The pressure and tension here is amplified when we learn that Cafe isn't just fighting against the timer that will seal away his prized possession, but also against forces in Clocktown, like Andrew's mom, that are working against him. 
Without this additional context, we are still treated to a fun and unique bit of emotionally charged gameplay, but at this point it should go without saying that what takes this quest from Zelda's upper echelon to the best in its history are the additional pieces of information that add significance to moments like this. Alright, so we've talked a lot about what makes the Anju and Cafe quest great thus far, but before we wrap up, it's important to recognize that for all the praise I've been heaping on this quest, it's not perfect by any means. For one, as much as I enjoy the organic reveal of many of these events across multiple cycles, if you aren't a fan of this story, it can be frustrating to have to replay it twice if you want to get all its rewards. Again, I enjoy the ability to make decisions within the narrative that affect what is possible, but it's not lost on me that this can be annoying to deal with when you just want to get your file to 100% completion. To that end, many of the actual rewards you do receive in this quest are quite underwhelming. The Keaton mask, Postman's hat, and Couple's mask all ultimately end up netting you a piece of heart, and unless you finish the quest right before beating the game, the bottle of Chateau Romani you receive from Madame Aroma is somewhat disappointing as well. I understand the empty bottle can be useful, but in a game where you already can earn 5 others, it would have been nice to obtain something more unique. Also not lost on me is the fact that some of the events in this quest main plot can be quite tricky to figure out initially. Many of them require you to be in the right place at the right time, and unless you are completely dialed in on the quest, it can be easy to miss stuff because you're distracted by Majora's Mask overarching plot. And even when you do know where to be and when, there are still opportunities to mess up and waste all the progress you've made in that cycle. Honestly, you don't know pain until you fail to retrieve the sun mask, or even worse, if Sakon sees you outside his hideout and flees because you didn't realize you weren't fully hidden. Pro tip, use the stone mask and save yourself the anxiety. All things considered, the Anju and Cafe story deserves all the praise it gets and more. From the way it is able to seamlessly integrate the overarching plot of Majora's Mask Falling Moon into its story, to its ability to get you to care about a plethora of different characters, no other side quest in Zelda compares to the depth and level of emotion found here. It's engaging, rewarding, and also provides interesting gameplay that wonderfully complements the game's main gimmick. Its blend of tragedy and hope makes it the perfect quest for a game like Majora's Mask because it captures its central themes perfectly. And above all else, it delivers a simple yet nuanced story with plenty of rewarding hidden content that makes it fun to play for veterans and newcomers alike. I love this quest personally because it made me appreciate a game that was already one of my favorites on a new level. I'll never forget the first time I realized I could simply choose to not give Cafe's pendant of memories to Anju, and how depressing it was to then watch Cafe show up to an empty room during the final hours. The way he takes accountability for what has transpired is extremely sad, and evoked an emotional response for me that few games are able to do. And whether it's smiling while watching Anju's grandmother lie to her granddaughter to get out of eating her terrible food, or laughing upon learning I could kill Sakon during the robbery sequence in North Clocktown, I appreciate how this quest gets me to feel something. I hope in the future we are able to see a side quest in a future Zelda game get this much effort put into it. One with a relatable story that has multiple interesting characters, unique gameplay with several different outcomes, and plenty of secrets that add depth and replayability to the quest. But let me know what you think down in the comments below. What do you think is the best side quest in Zelda history? And if you agree that it's the story of Anju and Cafe, be sure to tell me what you love about it or why you think it's the best. Thanks for watching.